Well, um, it's uh, 7.35. We have 55 some people, some still joining, but I think it's time to get out of the way. Uh, I'm Tony Blake, president of the uh, Red Deer River Naturalists. Uh, tonight is uh, something we've done before. Uh, we're piggybacking on Nature Alberta's Zoom account, uh, and uh, it's been advertised all over the province or basically everywhere. So who knows is out there tonight. Uh, uh, we have a, a great guest. So um, I'm just going to give it over to our speaker coordinator, Sally Stewart, to uh, introduce Heather. And I'm going to try and uh, give her co make her co-host so she can uh, make her presentation. So take it away, Sally. Okay, well, hi, I'm uh, Sally Stewart, and like Tony said, I, I usually try and book the speakers. And so, yes, I'm delighted this evening that we've got Dr. Heather Addy with us. She's from, a, she's a faculty member at the University of Calgary. And I mean, I, I can't say I know Heather particularly well or anything, but we do generally meet once a year because we have a, a sort of group biology meeting where everybody teaching biology across the province gets together. And it's always been a delight to hear some of Heather's presentations. Though I have to say, she's given presentations on things like different statistical tools, which I'm you know, very envious about, because she's obviously very good with stats. So that's, that's something else that I admire. But to me, I'm thrilled that we've managed to find an expert on fungi, because it seems to me there are so few people who study fungi anymore. And last year, for the first time at, at the college, we got our students to engage in the iNaturalist program, and we got them to look for some fungi, and we told them, oh, don't worry, you know, you can get an approximate identification, put them up, and various experts will come along, and they'll just be delighted to tell you what they are. And that's the one thing that we've heard from students is nobody comes along and tells you what your what your fungi is when you've got it up then. So, so Heather, if you're not ever on there, go to iNaturalist, please. And, and our students would be absolutely delighted to, to hear, hear from you. Now, most of us are, are a little bit, you know, we think we know a little bit about fungi, but all we occasionally see is a little bit of evidence for a fungi. But what we don't realize is that beneath our feet, the, the ground is teeming with them. So to me there, I know very little about them. And I'll be thrilled to learn some more about them tonight. And I'm hoping some of our students might be there in the audience. And I'm sure they're hoping to learn more about um, fungi as well. And hopefully one or two of them might be inspired and they might actually choose that as the direction they wish to go in when they've finished. One thing I would like to say just to speak just before Heather gets going here, and Heather's won all sorts of teaching awards as well. She's a great teacher. Um, if you go went to the UFC website, you'd see she's, she's won all sorts of teaching awards. But one thing I did want to say as we begin here tonight is it's very exciting for, for me because Red Deer College recently was granted to re-granting status. So we're actually now Red Deer Polytechnic. But what's exciting is we've got a biology degree and some of our third year students, we've never had third year students before. This is our first year to have third year students. Some of them are in the audience tonight. At least I hope they are, because I was speaking to one earlier today and she, she told me, she said, oh, I'm coming to the talk tonight. Sounds really interesting. So Heather, hopefully there's a few students there as well as all the people from across Alberta, from the Red Deer River Naturalists and all the other associations. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it across to you. Oh, I don't know if Tony's managed to get the sharing going yet. That's the he, he, has. he I, has. I am able to share my screen. I'm pretty sure I will determine that for sure in a minute, but I am admitting people from the waiting room. So all this power. And I want to say thank you so much for the invitation to speak to your group. And I, I guess uh, people elsewhere in Alberta, but Red Deer is, is near and dear to my heart because I actually was born and grew up in Red Deer for about six, seven years, and then I got whisked away to Edmonton, but I have very fond memories of spending time in Kin Canyon and Rotary Park, and I was just looking around the little Zoom windows, and I see some, some familiar names. I don't see faces, but Elizabeth Bobia is here, and uh, Rika Hall-Bayer, so I, I didn't get further down the list than that, but it's great to uh, connect with people. So I will endeavor to share my screen, and... 
don't know that you need to see my little face while whilst I'm talking. If you want my little face in the corner, let me know and I'll throw it back on. Um, it sounds like there's a Q&A session at the end, but if you have burning questions as we go through, please just, um, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask. Um, so, you know, being aware that I'm talking to a group of naturalists, I think you are people that have a greater familiarity with fungi than, than many um, people out there do. You spend a lot of time outside hiking and doing photography or bird watching. And so you're noticing these fungi around you, especially at this time of year when they're fruiting bodies, they're, the mushrooms, etc., are so obvious. But a lot of people, um, when they think about fungi, they, they really only start thinking about fungi when fungi become a problem for them. So mold in their house, hopefully not quite to the extent you see here, fairy rings pop, popping up in their lawns that um, upset some people, or fungal infections on themselves. So there's some horrible athletes put down at the bottom, um, or ringworm on their kids or their pets is often when people start noticing and thinking about fungi. And more and more, more in the news, oops, my usual Zoom problems where I click and nothing happens. There's a lot of stories that pop up in the news um, increasingly with the um, severe fungal diseases that are caused in many animals, including humans. So the white nose syndrome in bats that is now here in Canada, the um, fungus that is wiping out amphibian species around the world. It is the greatest extirpation of vertebrates in history caused by a fungus. Um, the death cap mushrooms that are now have been introduced into BC and are spreading because they are associated with many trees that we plant um, as ornamental things. And, and now we're getting death caps popping up and they're very harmful, obviously, as you can see from the headline to children and pets in partic particular. And uh, fungal diseases of humans are on the rise too. And that might've been something you heard about and read about this summer with the um, COVID wave in India, um, that many people survived COVID only to be stricken with a fungus that um, was infecting their brains and eyes and um, very difficult to survive. So there's that side of fungi, sort of the, the harmful evil side, but at the same time, fungi are really having a moment right now. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the news about effective treatment for depression and uh, addiction and um, helping people who are facing the end of life, perhaps with cancer, um, magic mushrooms seem to be a really effective treatment. And we're also making a lot of very cool products out of fungi. So the two people at the bottom have made um, planters and there's furniture made out of fungi, there's clothing, there's leather made out of fungi. And we may be able to use fungi to replace packaging and plastic and even things like headphones and runners. So fungi are able to be both enemies or foes causing damage and illness, but also friends or maybe even saviors. And even if we aren't thinking about sort of modern things with fungi, you can't have a celebration without fungi. So everything in this picture pretty much involved fungi, the wine, the bread, the cheese, the cured meat, even the wooden cutting board would require fungi to be involved. Oh, can I maximize my screen? It is appearing as a window only. Hmm, that is interesting. Uh, I do not know. So this is how I always have my window when I'm teaching and I've, oh, do you mean me, this little thing? Do you mean that? Or is it the, the images of the fungi. I'm seeing full screen, but I don't know if everybody else is. I can click start slideshow, sure. Often that causes problems for me when I'm teaching, but is that better? Yeah, we, we can see the full picture now. Awesome. So you didn't get to see all of the little tiny, awful ringworms oh, yeah. and things? Yeah. Oh, okay. We just they had the ring around it. Oh, okay. I will continue. Thanks for letting me know. So all of these things about fungi, their, their um, ability to be friends and foes and to provide us with all of these things for, for celebrations really comes down to a few key things about their biology, about how they grow and how they feed. So I thought we would start there and then sort of come back out to look at how they are playing these roles. 
um, in our lives and in the lives of other organisms. So now let someone else in. Oops, see that's. So as Sally was saying, um, often, you know, if I ask my students to draw a fungus, what does a fungus look like? They'll draw a mushroom because that's the part that we are most familiar with. But the body of the fungus, um, as Sally also alluded to, is growing, in this case, underground. It's growing in whatever its food source is. And the body of the fungus is um, made up of these very fine filaments um, known as hyphae, but we'll just call them filaments because we don't need to keep using all the terminology. But they are these little fine threads. And over here, this is a lovely drawing with the spore that has germinated. Um, and the spores are like the seeds of the fungus. And these filaments grow out of that spore and they start to branch. And they continue to branch and grow outwards from their tips, forming a roughly radial network, which is called a mycelium. And all of those tips are extending outwards and branching to fill in that space very completely. So the, the fungus is completely filling and colonizing whatever it's growing in, which is its substrate. And you can see that in these images here, you can see how very, very fine the filaments are. And they can also in some cases kind of aggregate together in these cords that can then move very effectively. So if we, if we zoom in on what these fungi are, these tips are doing. Um, the image on the right is just a zoomed in microscope image showing you how they're branching and um, fusing together in some cases to build really good connections. And if we look at a single hypha that is branched, the very tip of the hypha is releasing some enzymes. So digestive enzymes, just like we would produce in our stomachs. And unlike us, the fungi um, don't ingest food and digest it. They release their enzymes. So like us releasing our stomach enzymes, those break down the large complex molecules in whatever this fungus is growing through. So wood or plant debris or your arm, whatever they're growing through. And they break that down into soluble nutrients that it can then absorb. The other thing this hypha is doing um, this line here is showing you there's a wall around that hypha. So fungi are very closely related to animals, but unlike animals, their cells have a wall. And what that means is as water flows into the hyphae and the, the hyphae or filaments encourage that, they build up quite a high concentration of sugars. The water flows in and increases the volume inside the filament but the wall resists. And so we get pressure building up inside the hyphae. It's, it's just like if you're pumping up your bike tire, you're pumping air into the inner tube and that pushes against the bike tire wall, which is not giving way, it's resisting. So you get a pressurized bike tire. Same thing in a hypha. And, and they are actually at about the same pressure as your bike tire. So if they get cut or injured, they can you know, gush their, their contents out. But what that pressure means is that the fungus is not only digesting as it's going, it's actively pushing into or invading into its food. And if you get several hyphae together, they can exert a whole lot of pressure. I have an image later on of, of how these fungi are able to grow through cement and asphalt. And it's because those hyphae work together to exert even more pressure and push their way through things. Um, so they're, they're eating and tunneling as they go, and it's all these separate filaments doing that. But the fungus is um, not just a collection of, of filaments. Oops, sorry. It is an entity. There's a wonderful book out by Marlon Sheldrake called Entangled Life. And the quote you can see here is from him. And I think it's really important to remember that when we're looking at a mycelium, it is a being. It's an entity that is planning and making decisions and um, has a consciousness and an intelligence, which is kind of a strange thing to say about uh, a fungus. We're used to not thinking about plants or fungi, anything outside of animals having intelligence. But um, there's several studies that show things like if this is this eye here is our initial starting point. So it's a block of wood that's infected with the fungus or colonized by the fungus. And the fungus has grown out from that block, as you can see with these threads coming out here. So that's all the filaments. And you can see it's formed sort of a, 
a radial colony. If we put another block of wood here, that's a really rich resource for it. It starts sending hyphae out because those hyphae are exploring in all directions. But once they discover that block of wood, it very intentionally um, amplifies that one pathway. So a whole bunch of hyphae grow together to make one of those cords. And the other thing the fungus is doing is it's retracting hyphae from over here. So it's taking away that radial network it built, taking away the biomass and moving it over to this new block, and it's going to explore out from there. So it is sensing its environment in all directions and making choices about where's the best place to go at the time. So it is very intentionally planning and making decisions. Um, as that network is growing and feeding, it's changing its environment and reducing the nutrient content. And th that change triggers um, the fungus to make spores. So it is basically saying, this is not a great place to live anymore, let's escape. And in some fungi, um, it will make spores asexually, um, which are made very simply. You get some little filaments growing straight up out of that network, and they basically just bubble at the tips sort of like blowing bubbles through a ring, soap bubbles through a ring, and those just get borne away by the wind or by insects. And so when we think about molds in your house, hopefully not looking like this, those are fungi that are producing abundant asexual spores like this, or something like powdery mildew, which is really abundant right now. The leaves have that white powdery appearance. That's from all of these little tiny spores. So many fungi, um, when they start running out of nutrients, will start to make spores in this way. But other fungi um, make these very big, uh, elaborate spore producing structures. So these are sexual structures that are part of their sexual reproduction. Many, many different kinds, but the kind that, that's most familiar to us and I think are the most intriguing are these mushrooms made by a certain group of, of fungi. And these uh, spore producing structures can make billions of spores. And some of them will live for more than one year or the fungus will produce some of them every year. So over a lifetime of these fungi, um, they will make, I don't know, even know how many billions of spores. And the very interesting thing about these fruiting bodies, you know, next time you're out in the woods, if you, if you feel the caps of them, which is where the spores are being produced, there's all these gills or sometimes pores under the cap the cap will feel cool. And the fungus um, uses evaporation to cool the cap. And when the spores get released, um, this evaporative cooling of the cap actually creates a wind. It's called the spore wind. And the spores get carried away from the, the fruiting body and get picked up by the wind further away from the fruiting body, which is more turbulent but the fungus itself is creating this wind to help get the spores out and away. So billions and billions of, of little fungi being born on the wind. Um, so these, these networks that are forming and producing spores in various ways at various times can be very small. So you can see a network um, evident on fruit or if you leave a loaf of bread on your counter. So some fungi just make quite small um, networks and they will very quickly produce all of those asexual spores as you see on the bread there. They kind of live fast, die young, have a lot of spores. Other fungi, which would include the ones that make the lovely mushrooms that we were seeing, um, can have very large networks that continue to grow and extend over many years. Um, and just gonna do that. Um, grow and extend over many years and the center might die out but they'll continue to grow as a ring. And that's um, what you're seeing in this image, which is showing various mycelia of the humongous fungus, a species of, it was Armillaria, I think it's now changed to Armillariella, but this is, um, it's actually a plant pathogen, but it belongs to that group of fungi that make the big fruiting bodies. And it is the largest organism on earth. There's probably larger fungal colonies that we haven't found yet, but this one right now is the biggest one in the world and it is about 1800 football fields in size. So these networks can get very big. 
So that's how they're growing and how they're feeding. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was what they're feeding on, because this is where we start to see a lot of the places where our lives intersect with them. So we can break fungi down into two very broad groups. And the fungi don't know that we have created these two groups and they don't like to stay in their group. They will move back and forth sometimes, but the two groups are um, fungi feeding on organic molecules produced by other organisms, which are heterotrophs, which is the same as what we are. We are also heterotrophs. So these fungi are feeding on organic molecules and they can either get those organic molecules from dead organic matter, so they are decomposers, or they can get those organic molecules from living organisms. So most of the time when we think about fungi, we think of decomposers. And they're actually almost as many that get their nutrients from living organisms as from decomposers. But those are the ones we tend to think about the most. And, and so here's a lovely um, fungus decomposing the stump, forming these lovely fruiting bodies coming off the side. And these organisms um, are very important in, in ecosystems because they are breaking down um, organic matter, especially plant matter, of cellulose and lignin that um, most organisms can't break down. And if we didn't have the fungi, we would be surrounded by piles of dead leaves and dead wood. So they are essential in ecosystems. The problem comes when they are breaking down things that we don't want them to break down. So here's this um, idea of the pressure that the hyphae can produce. Here are fruiting bodies coming up through asphalt and concrete. And here's some fruiting bodies coming through a wall and a rock wall in this case. And these fruiting bodies on the bottom are from um, the fungus that causes dry rot, which is a very serious problem in many parts of the world. Um, so here's a fungus that's a decomposer breaking down plant matter, and we don't want it to be doing that. It's breaking down our houses or our, our fences or our decks. And it's the same ability to form a, a network that's growing through its food source and digesting and pushing its way through as it goes. So sometimes not what we want, but many organisms um, rely on this decomposability of fungi. So a good example are the leaf cutter ants, which are in Central, Central America. And these ants spend their entire lives going out and cutting pieces of plants and bringing these little pieces of plants back to their nest. And um, it was, you know, before people understood this relationship with the fungus, the question was, well, why are they doing that? Because they can't digest the leaves. It was thought that they were for shelter or something. Um, but what they're doing is they cut these pieces of, of leaves, bring them back to their nests, and they create a garden. So what you're seeing here, this white fluffy stuff, is the, the filament... Uh-oh. Have we lost Heather? Fungus. That's their only food source for their whole lives. And they're relying on this ability of the fungus to break down the leaves. And I'm getting a little note that my internet connection is unstable. So if I freeze and you miss things, please let me know. So ants rely on this ability of the fungus to digest organic matter, but so do we. We have, and this is a oyster fungus. The scale is hard to see in this upper image, but this is a large pile of um, material that's been contaminated with oil. And the oyster fungus is growing through this debris and breaking down the oil. Um, so it, it's a fungus that we can use in bioremediation, or specifically since it's a fungus, it would be microremediation. We also use fungi uh, and their ability to grow through things and produce enzymes to um, create self-healing concrete. So concrete, um, as you know, will, will end up getting cracked after years of exposure and various ways to seal those cracks, but it's been discovered you can inject fungi into the concrete and they will grow and um, spread and help the concrete self-heal. And one of the most exciting 
ways that we use these decomposer fungi is in this production of um, various products. So there's a company in the States called Ecovative, which is I think one of the first and one of the most successful companies. And at the end in, in the resources section, um, there's a TED talk by the, the fellow that started this company, Eben Bayer. And they grow the fungi in these molds um, and it takes the shape of the mold as it's digesting whatever you put in there. And, and it's a, a way to use up kind of waste material um, like corn stalks and things like that. And they are making packaging um, and various kinds of furniture and even um, building materials. So drywall and uh, materials like that can be made by these decomposer fungi which I think is just fascinating. The other place that fungi will get nutrients, if they aren't decomposers, and even if they sometimes are decomposers, um, they can play more than one role. But many fungi will um, not feed on dead organic matter. They are still getting nutrients from another organism, but they are associating with a living organism. And that partnership can be um, one in which both are benefiting, which would be a mutualism, or as we'll see in a minute, it can be where only the fungus is benefiting. But probably the, the best example of an association where the fungus is getting its nutrients from a living organism and both are benefiting is mycorrhizas. And the word mycorrhiza literally means fungus root. So this is an association where the fungus is growing in the soil but it's also growing into the roots of the plants and it's spreading out into the soil and acting like an extension of the root um, system. So it's creating a higher surface area for picking up nutrients. And because the fungus makes all these enzymes and can break down things that a plant can't break down, it's allowing the plant to get at a wider range of nutrients. So most plants are mycorrhizal, for at least part of their life. So this is as normal for plants as being photosynthetic. And a really exciting um, side to this story about mycorrhizas has just come out in the last few years. And, and in particular, there's a Canadian scientist, Suzanne Simard in BC, who has done some incredible work to help us understand that not only is the fungus growing into an individual plant and helping that individual plant, but the fungus connects plants of the same or different species. And the plants then are not only getting nutrients from the soil through the fungus, they are able to share nutrients among each other. And one of the things Suzanne Samard has shown is that there are these mother trees, large mature trees that supply smaller seedlings um, in particular with nutrients. We also have found that um, the plants are able to share um, signals. Um, so they're communicating through these fungal networks and they are sharing defense compounds. And um, she talks about this as everything in the forest is the forest. So when we're seeing a forest, it is not a collection of um, individuals that are competing, or perhaps it's not just individuals that are competing because that's a, a element of what's going on in nature, but there's also connection and communication. And this idea that everything in the forest is the forest, I think has a lot of implications for us in Alberta as in other countries. Um, we make a lot of use of forest products and we have a certain way that we have traditionally harvested those products and that is to go in and clear cut and we remove everything. And we're not leaving the mother trees and we're not thinking about how are we going to leave something behind to sustain those fungi while there are no trees. Yes, we're gonna come back and replant, but what happens if we lose those fungal connections in the meantime? How will those new trees survive without those connections? So I think this new understanding about um, common mycorrhizal networks and, and how they build these worlds for plants is really important for us to think about here in Alberta. And I, I have completely lost track of time, I have to say. So 
I have a few more slides. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, Sally. Do I need to zoom through a few things? Um, I'm just finding this one. Five past eight. No, you're, you're fine. You just go along at your own speed. That's great. Okay. So a similar, in some ways, a similar message for us here in Alberta, I think about fungi, has to do with lichens. So these are another example of a symbiosis um, and other organisms and often looked at and probably mostly true that both the fungus and the other organism are benefiting a little bit less clear than with the mycorrhizal association and in this case um, the fungus is not forming a large network that goes out and explores and, and uses enzymes um, if we think about what we talked about for fungi up to this point if you think of those fungi as hunter-gatherers, they're going out and exploring and searching for food. Lichens are fungi that have discovered agriculture. Um, and that's how Trevor Goward, who is a lichenologist in BC, describes them. And I think it captures it brilliantly that, that these are lichens that um, grow a crop, kind of like the leafcutter ants, but, a, but different. Um, if you think about the fungus taking its filaments and its network, and instead of spreading out through the soil or through wood, it builds a, a greenhouse. So it's making a very compact and elaborate structure in which it grows um, algae or photosynthetic bacteria. And it creates the perfect conditions for those little crops to do really well. So these structures that you're seeing here are the bodies of these lichens. They can be crusts on rocks. They can be these lovely little cups and trumpets or these beautifully branched reindeer lichens. And in all of those, the fungus has made this greenhouse and is nurturing its crop. And um, lichens are very complicated in their, in their physiology um, and they're very slow growing overall and why we in Alberta need to be thinking about them and caring about them for many reasons, partly because they are beautiful and complex organisms in their own right, but they are very important for caribou. So caribou rely on many kinds of lichens, particularly in winter for, for forage. And you can see these caribou are tunneling into the snow and they'll be eating the lichens um, that are on the ground. And it's um, incredibly important for them for getting through the winter and lichens are very slow growing. They need very specific conditions. And so we tend to find them mostly in old growth forests. And um, as we are harvesting those forests, it takes a very long time for the lichens to come back. And the conditions in the young forests that we plant are not very conducive to lichens. And that's part of what's happening to caribou. Now there's obviously many other pressures on caribou, they're losing more than just the lichens, they're losing habitat. Their habitats are being disturbed, um, which allows the predators in. But the, the caribou in Alberta are certainly threatened, if not endangered. And um, this connection between them and lichens is something we also need to be thinking about when we're thinking about how we're harvesting our forests. So the, the last topic, and I should have rearranged things perhaps so we didn't end on this note, although I find this topic about fungi really fascinating, is we are under increasing threat from fungal pathogens. And pathogens are another example of fungi feeding on living organisms. So they're getting organic molecules from living organisms. But in this case, the living organism is not benefiting at all. It's obviously being harmed. And the probably the most serious or some of the most serious fungal diseases are ones we've touched on a bit, the white nose syndrome in bats. There's a related um, disease in snakes. I can hardly stand to look at that poor snake. Um, the chytrid disease that's wiping out fungi around the world and um, rusts, which for us here in Alberta historically has been an issue. Um, this, this rust fungus produces um, a, an amazing diversity of spores that are very small and can be carried around the world. And there's a new strain that's emerged in India um, and it is spreading around the world. And we spent a long time breeding rust resistant um, wheat. And unfortunately this new strain of rust is able to overcome a lot of those defenses. So in all of these ways, um, 
fungi are becoming more serious pathogens. And if we look at um, how many different kinds of pathogens there are of different organisms, there are lots and lots of plant pathogens, many insect pathogens, um, very few, relatively speaking, of mammals. And humans have hardly any fungal pathogens. But the, the worrying thing is that when we look at these pathogens of humans, these are not specialized pathogens. The, the pathogens of plants and insects and even of other mammals can be very specialized. Um, not so much for the white nose syndrome, I guess. Many of these are actually decomposer fungi that are not um, specialized to be pathogens, but we have created conditions so that those decomposer organisms just see us as yet another substrate to be decomposed and we are now susceptible to them. So if we, if we look at the number of total cases of infections that are causing um, alarms in terms of the, the agencies that monitor, monitor these things, you can see that as we've gone from the mid 1990s to, we're not quite up to the current era, but pretty close, there are more and more cases plant infecting fungi and animal infecting fungi that are coming to sort of global um, alert status. Most of this plant um, spike will be that rust fungus. A lot of this animal spike is white nose syndrome and the, the fungus killing the frogs. But some of that is also human infections. And the reasons why um, these cases are increasing, if we think just about the animals and, and humans within that, is partly we are creating conditions that favor the fungus. So climate change, for example, makes it a lot more favorable for them to infect the frogs. We transport fungi around the world, which is how white nose syndrome found new victims. Um, but the other thing that we're changing is when we think about human pathogenic fungi, don't see that one again, is um, our own protection has two pillars. And this would be similar for things like the bats and even the frogs. They also have an immune system. So our immune system can attack um, invaders, including fungi. So every breath you take, you're inhaling fungal spores and those will go into your lungs. And if you're healthy, your immune system will combat those. The other thing that protects us is our high body temperature. But most fungi don't grow well at our high body temperature. So we have created a lot of potential for these fungi because of many of our medical advances. So it used to be that people who had cancer would not have survived. And when we first, um, when AIDS first burst on the scene, we did not have a way to help those people survive. Well, now we do have these medical advances, but we now have a very large population, relatively speaking, that does not have a really strong immune system. And so they are more susceptible to fungal disease. So that's partly why it is more prevalent and we hear about it more. Like after COVID, those people had suppressed immune systems and so we're much more susceptible. The other thing that protects is our high body temperature. So relatively few fungi can grow at high body temperature. And so there's only this handful, this dozen, that we really have to worry about. But as the climate is changing and our environmental temperature is increasing, more and more fungi will be selected for growing at a higher body temperature. And so we are chipping away at our other pillar um, of what protects us against fungi. And that seems like a very um, negative note to end on, but I, I hope I've given you an idea of how the very basic biology of fungi, especially their ability to grow with these invasive filaments and produce enzymes, makes them both very valuable to us in terms of building products and new solutions for things like plastics, but also that same ability when turned against us makes them a threat and something we need to be learning more about. Um, there are not very many um, medications and, and antifungal drugs 
that work very well because of how closely related they are to us. And they tend to be, fungi tend to be overlooked. And what we need is more understanding of them and more um, ability to control them and also to use them and understand them. And I will quit. I will quit nattering at you now and stop sharing so that I can see you. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, everybody go to the reactions button and you, you can clap just like I am. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I'm sure there's many, many questions for you. I, I would just ask people to use the chat room and uh, I'll read the question for you if they don't mind. That way we can avoid a riot here. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for people to type in their questions, I've got one for you. Sure. And it's kind of about how you closed there. You, you talked about fungi being selected for various things. How does it compare with animal or plant evolution? Are, are fungi just so diverse that there's a fungus for every opportunity or do they actually evolve that fast? Uh, I know uh, things like mosquitoes can be right. resistant to a pesticide within you know, 100 generations or so. Are, are fungus the same? So for sure some fungi... Oop, I lost you. Um, the ability to... Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, for, for sure some fungi do have very rapid life cycles um, and have this ability to evolve very quickly. So some of the most serious fungal pathogens are actually fungi that grow as yeasts or can morph, switch between yeast and hyphal growth. And so they would go through their reproductive cycles very quickly and replicate quickly, giving them a chance to evolve quite quickly. But fungi are also very, very diverse. We, we know only a tiny fraction of the existing fungi and many fungi live inside other organisms. Many live inside plants and we have never discovered them and we know nothing about them. So I think it's a combination of there's more out there than we think there are and they're able to change quickly. Okay. Um, from Rod Trento, uh, is flesh eating disease a fungal infection? infection? Um, so as far as I know, it is bacterial. It's, um, I don't remember the kind of bacteria, but I'm pretty sure it's bacterial. But certainly there are fungi that will grow, not necessarily flesh eating, but like the, the black fungus that was causing this issue in India. The fungus, um, because of how it grows invasively, it's growing through your cells and through your tissue. And so the only way to remove it, if a fungal drug isn't, isn't effective, which um, often there's not that many of them, and many of them will be harmful to us because we're so closely related. So often the only way to remove that infection is surgery. And that's what was happening for people in India was that they were having you know, their eyes removed and parts of their brains removed because the fungus had just grown with those little filaments right through all of their cells. Almost, almost as bad as cancer. Yeah. Maybe even worse, probably grows faster. Okay. Uh, there's a comment here. It was critical about fungi going in radioactive zones. Uh, something about yes. well, fungus eats nuclear radiation via radiosynthesis. Is this possible? Yes. This fungi are just so fascinating in so many ways. So they discovered after the Chernobyl um, meltdown, I, I can't remember how long after, that there was a fungus growing inside the reactor. And it is growing elsewhere in Chernobyl, but it's growing right in that um, reactor core. And the fungus is, um, it's black, like the one we just talked about in India. Many fungi have a, a thick layer of melanin, which is the same kind of thing we have giving pigment to our cells, but fungi accumulate so much they will look black. And that melanin is very protective. It protects them against um, extreme temperatures. It protects them against antifungal drugs. It protects them against our immune system. And what seems to be happening is that the fungus is able to use the radiation um, as an energy source. So the melanin is absorbing that energy from the radiation and making it not only not harmful, 
the fungus seems to be able to use that to grow. So they are radiotrophic or radiation eating. And, oh. and there's a researcher in Saskatchewan who's working on these fungi. And not only are they thinking we could use them to clear up radioactive uh, contaminated areas, they're also seeing, could we make radiation shields for people that are exposed to high level of radiation from these fungi, which is just kind of mind boggling. Well, just a little. That's, that's something out of science fiction. It yes. really is. Fantastic. Okay, uh, moving right along here. Um, do you think fungal infections can cause serious global issues just as the current COVID virus has? And how are fungal infections contracted? So fungal infections of humans um, don't spread from human to human in the same way that the coronavirus does. So we acquire them from the environment and most of them are acquired by inhaling spores. So almost all fungal infections start in the lungs. And for most of us, that's not a big deal. Your lungs, the cilia and the mucus gets rid of them and your immune system um, can tackle them. But if you're immunocompromised or if you inhale a whole bunch of them, um, so there's a, an Aspergillus species, Aspergillus flavus, that has caused problems for people um, on farms. Or if you have a, com a compost pile and you lean over and take a great big inhale, this would not be a good idea because then you get a whole bunch of these little tiny spores in your lungs and that can overwhelm your immune system. But you won't pass that infection on to someone else. Um, so we won't see that same kind of spreading from person to person. It's much more everybody's in an environment where they're getting infected from that same environmental source. Okay, um, no and, plagues. Don't worry about huge. No, no plagues, but a good example of that is um, a cryptococcus species, which is one of these things that can switch from a yeast to a filament growth. Um, on Vancouver Island, cryptococcus gatii, Vancouver Island was the global epicenter of that. And it was people on the beach, I wanna say near Parksville, people were getting sick, animals were getting sick because there were all these spores in that environment on the beach. And um, yeah, so that was sort of a local outbreak but it wasn't spread from person to person. Just a, a whole bunch of spores. Okay, since fungi tend to spread in such large quantities, how would we even go about combating chytrid? Is there any hope oh, in the yeah. near future? Well, there is some hope. Um, so not all frogs in a population are equally susceptible. Some of them seem to maybe have a different bacterial population on their skin so that they are able to fight them off. Um, there seems to be some microbes that some frogs and amphibians have that produce toxins that, that can prevent fungal infection. So that's one source of hope. Um, there are very localized things that people are doing, you know, getting the frogs out of that environment, bringing them to a zoo or something and raising them there and trying to mitigate the environment and then reintroduce the frogs. Um, the problem is that's so labor intensive, it's really not something that we can do on a, on a big scale. Um, you know, probably the other things to do is look at what has changed for those populations. It's partly we've spread this pathogen around the world um, through, seems to be through bullfrog populations um, with people buying them for um, pets. pets, essentially. And so we've shipped them around the world. But the amphibians are under a lot of pressure for other reasons, habitat loss, climate change, um, pesticides. So we could take steps to take away those pressures from the amphibians and that would probably help them survive better. But there is right now no way to prevent the chytrid outbreaks. Okay. No, no, quite right. There's nothing like stress to bring on disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, why is fungi not more often used in radiation activities? Is it restricted to smaller areas or can it be effective in large areas as well? Uh, also, thank you so much for this more than interesting presentation from the Lethbridge Natural Society. Hello, Lethbridge. Hi, Hi Lethbridge. Um, so I think, hmm, yes, many, many, many thoughts. Um, I think it's partly 
fungi are not studied very much. Um, there are not very mycologists, very many mycologists out there anymore. And so we don't spend a lot of time and attention on fungi, I think is the first thing. And there are a lot of challenges in scaling up um, remediation from the lab or even the picture I showed you, that sort of one pile of stuff to try and scale that up to the environment has a lot of challenges. Um, so it's based on fungi using those enzymes that they can break down plant material with to break down contaminants. And they can do that, but they're not going to choose to break down that contaminant if there's other easier to get things in that environment. So if there's some lovely dead leaves, they're going to do that and not the contaminant. So how do we get them in that environment to focus on what we want them to eat if it's harder for them and more energy demanding? So I think it's a matter of trying to figure out the problems and how to address them. And we need more people studying fungi to do that. Or fungus breeders. <laughs> it's a great uh, growth area for sure for research. That and the, the ecovative sort of stuff, I think are, are great areas for people to be thinking about working in. Okay. No, I, I've got some more questions for you about that. But anyway, uh, Chaga. Does Chaga fall into this category of, of high melanin fungi? Um, I don't know that I don't know that chaga does, um, because the, the black fungi often when we're seeing those are um, more of a mold, like the one that they've discovered in Chernobyl is growing, you know, quite quickly producing a lot of asexual spores. There are certainly some that grow more slowly that have a lot of melanin, but I don't think I don't think chaga does, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, uh, lots of room for more questions. Okay, I want to ask you about our muscular mycorrhizae. It's, yes. There's some good research being done locally on that and its effect on agriculture. Yes. Opportunities for agriculture. Yeah, so we didn't talk about the different kinds of mycorrhizae. There's six or seven at least. And our muscular mycorrhizae are a group of fungi that do not live anywhere else but in association with plants. So some mycorrhizal fungi can live otherwise, they don't have to have that host, but um, our muscular mycorrhizal fungus has to be with its plant host. And they're a weird group of fungi because they don't seem to have any sexual stages, they don't make those nice big fruiting bodies. But there is a lot of evidence from a lot of studies around the world that they are really I mean, they're, they're normal for the plants to be associated with. And so many of our crop plants would normally be mycorrhizal with these arbuscular mycorrhizae. So things like wheat and corn and um, potatoes. But in the way we are growing our crops, just like with the forest, we are taking an approach where we often are disturbing the soil. So we're breaking up all of those networks of, um, uh, of fungi. And so we're making them less helpful to the plants. So there are ways to um, change the way we're, we're doing agriculture to foster and manage those mycorrhizal associations. And the, the person I did my PhD work with in Guelph, Murray Miller, um, did a lot of this work with, with corn in Ontario and finding that zero till um, was really effective in allowing the fungus to help the plant get phosphorus. The challenge there, and I, I'm not as familiar with the situation in Alberta, the challenge there is it can put a lot on the individual farmer because it might take a while for yield to come back up to where it would be if you were tilling and putting on fertilizer. And we, we want that kind of benefit as a society. We want healthier soils and maybe we don't wanna be using pesticides and fertilizers, but we have to support the farmers in making those choices because they're paying the brunt of, how long it takes to get the yield back up to where it could be. So lots of potential there. Yeah, there's, there's <clears throat> from what I understand, there's, there's no guarantee it's going to happen right away. Whereas with exactly. chemical, uh, synthetic nitrogen, yes, you know. Exactly. You have to. It's so much yield breaker. And, and it's these cultivating these, uh, these fungi, this, this natural soil biology is probably an art just as much as it is luck. Yeah, it takes a long time for that network to form and then you have to understand how to help it and maintain it. 
Um, I know there's a fellow at Mount Royal um, who's doing, Matthew Swallow, I think his name is, who's doing some really cool things. I don't think specifically with that fungus, but just trying to um, work with the natural soil microbes more. So lots of potential there as well. Just challenging to balance those economic issues with the biological issues. Yeah, but the potential is enormous if, if we can eliminate the need for chemical fertilizers. Yes. We have another question here. Uh, you mentioned fungi that are specialized to feed on humans, not passed from human to human, but is kittred different? And that is frog to frog? So the, the pathogen um, seems to be, again, one of these decomposer fungi. It's not specialized to feed on the frog. And so in some ways that's a good thing because it's not, um, it doesn't have special abilities to, to infect those frogs and make them sick. But the problem is because it is just a decomposer fungus, it's seeing the frog as just another substrate. And um, the fungus is then able to live in a variety of places in that environment. It can live in the soil, it's in the water, it can be infecting plants. All of those things to it are just food sources. So the frog is just another food source. And that's one of the reasons it's so hard to, to say mitigate there are people in Spain that have taken frogs out of ponds, cleaned the ponds, put fresh water back in, put the frogs in, and the fungus is still there because it is hiding in one of these other reservoirs in the plants, in the soil. Or so the spores are just raining from the sky for all we know. Well, the, these, these spores are um, in the water. They're actually, oh. they actually have little flagella on them in, in that fungus. Um, but what happens for a lot of these fungi that are not specialized as pathogens, so the ones that infect us are also these decomposer fungi, but because they're living in the soil, they have developed all of these traits to help them fend off amoebas and things in the soil that want to eat them. And they use those same defenses against us. And the way that our immune system attacks fungi, we use white blood cells, macrophages that engulf the fungal spores, exactly like how amoebas feed on fungi. So these fungi have defenses to prevent the amoebas from harming them. And they use those same defenses against our white blood cells. So they're very, very effective. They have this um, built-in uh, pathogenicity that has nothing to do with us, but they're just pre-adapted to be very awful. Yep, the, the target of opportunity. Yes. Okay, yeah. they're just versatile. Yes, dangerously so. Uh, here's another one. I found a mushroom near our house in the grass and it looked like a bleach. Never seen that before in our area. It was um, time, so I broke it into pieces and placed it on my lawn in the shade of the apple tree. Might it come back at some point? Uh, so I, I missed a little bit. I think you said it was a bolete. So no. lots of little pores under the caps. Those are certainly around. Um, our provincial mush mushroom is a bolete. Um, so if you broke it up and spores were released, it might well um, grow a new, a new network and come back. But if, if you saw one, you know, if you saw one fruiting body, that network is there underground. It's, it's kind of like you're not aware it's underground until the mushrooms come up, sort of like if you had a whole bunch of fruit trees in your yard and you didn't know until these apples popped up out of the ground. So <laughs> removing the, the mushroom probably, you know, the, the fungus is still there. It, it's like people that want to get rid of their fairy rings in their lawns and they go up and rip up all the mushrooms. Well, it's no. like taking the apples off your tree. The tree is still there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that mycelium, mm -hmm. probably going to live for years, decades, maybe even longer than you. Yeah. 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 The, um, the humongous fungus is hundreds of years old, if not thousands of years old. Okay. Uh, and last comment from Peggy. Fascinating. I... Thank you, Heather. Okay. I've got one last one. Um, we're talking about fungus infecting all sorts of other life forms. Does fungus go after fungus? Oh, yes. Yes, there are fungi that will um, infect other fungi and are parasites on fungi. Um, there's some, a very cool one that's a really important dye, 
fungus. Um, a friend of mine is an artist who, who works with mushroom dyes and lots of fungal art. And I can't remember the name of the fungus she would know, but it's a fungal parasite. Um, that's quite, quite fascinating. I, I did have a slide with resources and I wanted to show that just so people could see some of these books. And I apologize for going back in and sharing my slides one more time, but um, if I can, I maybe am not the host anymore. No, I, I left it. You should be able to. Uh, I just can't see what I'm doing. That's it. Hang on. Uh, this is just like how my students feel. I'm uh, going, what am I doing? Here. Okay. I'd like to give you references to Suzanne Simard. We are reading her book, Finding the Mother Tree. Yes. Out of the forest for our book club of the month. Uh, Several of our members are on this call. Can you elaborate on her work and her concepts? Thank you. I will try to do her justice. So I, I right did. There, second line. Yes. So these are just some things I would recommend. Merlin Sheldrake's book, um, Entangled Life, is he just writes beautifully. It just it's like poetry, really. Um, I've That's just started. Too. Pardon me. He has a TED talk too. Um, I have not heard his TED talk. There's a couple oh, TED talks. Yeah. That, at the bottom, I'd recommend the CBC Nature of Things, the Kingdom Fungi is um, a, a great little episode. I have not seen Fantastic Fungi myself, but my students love it. So I thought I'd recommend it. So Suzanne Simard um, is a fascinating work. And I think one of the most impressive things about her is that, um, you know, she was, she still is female obviously, but she was a young female working in the forestry industry. And because she came from a family with uh, history in that industry, I think she was able to navigate some of those challenges of, of being dismissed in some ways as kind of this tree hugger person um, because she had experience in that field herself and she came from that background. But her ideas um, have, it's been really fascinating to see how they've become much more mainstream because when she first started talking about trees um, sharing resources. It was like, oh yeah, socialism in soil and tree hugging. <laughs> and she has done an amazing number of um, very elaborate, maybe not elaborate, but elegant experiments to really show um, that there is evidence for what she's saying that mother trees, these large mature trees are supporting smaller seedlings um, and providing them with nutrients and that trees are sending um, signals because plants do talk. They do produce various compounds that send signals within their own bodies. And these signals can travel from one plant to another through mycorrhizal um, networks. So there is not necessarily a solitary tree in the forest that tree is connected to all sorts of other trees and plants and they are sharing various signals and nutrients. And she makes the point in the book, and sometimes I think it gets lost when some of this gets popularized. We have to remember that the fungus is not just these um, pipes. It's not an inert thing. That's an entity. And it has a vested interest in what is going to which plant. So from a fungal perspective, it's much better if it has a lot of partners who are all doing well and photosynthesizing. So your economy. Yes. So it's in the fungus's interest to keep all these plants alive instead of having them compete with each other and only having a few do well. It does better if it has a lot of good partners. So we can't think of it as the, the plants um, just doing this through this inert network. The fungus is a partner in what's going on. And that makes it even more challenging to understand because you are thinking about what are the plants doing and what is the fungus doing? But um, her book, and I'm not very far into it. I, I wish I was in your book club. Um, her book is written um, to make the science very clear and fascinating. And it makes clear how she went step by step and made these discoveries about how plants are interconnected through these uh, fungal networks and how there's kind of, again, this idea of consciousness and decision-making and planning and behavior that we don't usually think of for either plants or fungi. Mm. Well, we've kept you going for a full hour here, Heather. Uh, it, it's been fascinating and all sorts of good comments here. And you're a wonderful presenter. presenter. Oh. Well, 
Uh, that's very kind of you. I have to say, I don't know about all of you folks, but I have found it so hard to focus in these last 18 months, and in particular, the last month in, in what's going on in Alberta, and my brain is very scattered, and I apologize. I think I spoke a mile a minute and didn't finish a lot of sentences, but I, I appreciate the chance to talk to you about fungi. Well, your, your enthusiasm shines through. Anyway, uh, I believe this is your first time speaking to us. Uh, so we have a little gift for you. If you you're going to become one of that exclusive club that has an RDRN etched coffee mug. That'll be in the mail to you along with- Oh, thank stuff. you so much. That's so okay. kind of you. Uh, I would shake your hand if I could, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. So thanks so much for coming and, and do come back when, the, when you've got some more, more good research and, and stories <laughs> to tell. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was, it was okay. a pleasure and I hope to meet you all in person when we can do that. Okay. Back to the reaction button. Big clap for Heather. And uh, we'll see you next time. Now, uh, before I end the meeting, I just want to uh, have a sort of an unfortunate announcement. I don't think it's possible to have our banquet again. Normally, it would be mid-October, but uh, public meetings are, are just out right now, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, that's when we put our OWL award out. Um, we had a board meeting last night and we decided on the recipient. So uh, I shouldn't really re announce it tonight before I break the news to the guy, but uh, look for uh, an announcement on our social media uh, in your next newsletter and uh, on your emails and stuff. We'll, we'll do something, something celebratory. And uh, uh, does anybody else have any uh, anything they wanna bring up while we, have the uh, membership all together. Uh, just uh, you should be able to actually unmute yourself or or just send me a chat here. I'll, I'll leave the channel open um, for a few minutes here. Uh, Sally, uh, have I remembered everything? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks so much, Heather. I'll, I'll send you an email, but that was just wonderful. That was fantastic, most enjoyable, and you. You weren't talking a mile a minute. It might have felt like you were, but I, I thought you it was it was fantastic. Yeah.